Dr. Carl Jung, who's one of our most famous psychiatrists of all times, he himself said that he could not cure alcoholism, that he said that medicine doesn't have the answer. I don't want to be like this. I can't stop. I just can't. And he wanted to get me back into drugs. So he pulled out his needle and his works and pulled up the heroin, put a tourniquet around his arm, and he shot right in front of me. And I had no pull at all, no pull whatsoever. Hi, I'm Laverne Tripp and welcome to Born to Be Free. This episode is one of the most frightening episodes there probably will be. However, it is one of the most beneficial. To think and to come to the place that we make a decision to surrender everything to God, that's frightening. But you know what? It's because we don't know Him. As you listen to the stories of the people that's on this week, and, and I'll be sharing too just a little later, I hope you reach the place that you surrender your all because I promise you there's no life like living a life that is surrendered and let God take control. Stay tuned because you were born to be free. The surrender issue in gambling. Well, you know, I think that when you've gotten a bullet hole and every square inch of your body, you have no choice but to surrender. And I think that's what happened in gambling. I had lost everything. I was in bankruptcy court for seven years, paying off a of bankruptcy. Two years in Alabama, five years in Tennessee. You know, I used to watch those old John Wayne movies where he'd wave the white flag to surrender, and he surrendered to live when you were, when you were, and I, and I had always thought that I would die if I surrendered. Uh, but I really had nowhere to go but to the Lord. Uh, Constance, uh, you can live without alcohol, you can live without drugs, you can live without pornography. It's really tough to live without food. <laughs> Does that bring some different issues in <clears throat> surrender? Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, it complicates the issue for sure. That's the biggest problem. You cannot simply lay down and turn away from food. Um, you have to learn how to balance the role that food plays in your life. It's very much an, an ongoing daily thing, you know, and the, sur the surrendering thing um, is, I think I find it difficult to surrender anything to God. I mean, it's just a really, really hard thing to do because I'm independent and I can do this and I can do that and look, this worked and and it, I find that especially lately, of course, the closer you get to him, it seems the closer he draws you to him. And lately, he'll just keep bringing me to my knees, you know, things <laughs> just won't go right. And I'll be down on my knees, surrendered. Mm -hmm. And I, I, there's something very comforting about being in that place because when you're down on your knees, there's not really very much farther to fall. I woke up this morning incredibly stressed out about projects I've got to get done and about uh, time management problems and the taping today and thinking, you know, how is everything going to work out? And, and I really felt God reminded me that when we talk about surrendering to Him, we're not talking about surrendering to a really nice set of principles that works, at least we hope it will. The Christianity is not just about these guidelines we follow to live successful lives. This is a relationship. And, and I felt he was reminding me, I am an active agent in your life. You can cast your care upon me. I do care about you. And I find the more I work on intimacy with him, the more I know him personally, the more inclined I am to trust him enough to surrender to him. Because for me, surrender means I am, I am recognizing my limitations mm -hmm. and honest to God believing that he does have my best interest at heart and I can trust him. Yep. I, my point of surrender, as far as crack addiction was concerned, I had had enough. I can remember sitting up with um, 
friends that I got high with, and we would take a hit and talk about how disgusted we were that we couldn't yeah. stop. So that wasn't the issue. I was ready to quit. I didn't know how to. And um, I, I guess my first act of surrender was to go into treatment not knowing what it, all it was going to entail and involve. And then once I get there, and I'm like, okay, I'm here to give up crack cocaine and uh, promiscuity and, and alcohol. And, and they said, no, you need to stop lying. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> you know, what does that have to do? What, what's you know? that about? Yeah, what is that about? And, and, and you're a manipulator. And that was the first time I had heard that or been confronted on that level. I didn't think that I'd have to surrender those things because those things were what I used to function. That's what I used to live. You know, I manipulated the situation and followed the rules and you were supposed to like me and I would like you and everything would be okay. And it wasn't, it wasn't, I thank God that it was a Christian um, treatment facility because of the, the biblical principles that they taught me. You know, that, that took precedence over anything else. And um, <coughs> that, that took me for a loop. This old man cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard my cry and, and delivered me out of all my troubles. Psalms 34 and 6. I started drinking because uh, I felt, first of all, I seen my mother drinking. And I seen it was an escape from her, from reality. I dealt drugs from seventh grade through twelfth grade, marijuana. Never was busted. But it started with my uncle, my cousin, telling me that, listen, you can go. He showed me where he kept his stash. So every morning before school, I would roll up 100 joints, or 50, and take them to school and sell them. I made on average of $100 a day. And when you're in high school and junior high, that's good money for a 15, 16 year old. And I started progressing in cocaine. And first I was snorting, just snorting. And I would snort with friends and stuff after work and stuff like that. And next thing you know, I started missing work, started calling in late, coming in late, um, taking off, uh, missing appointments, all because of the, the cocaine. I felt in my life that I was losing my mind. I felt one day like I was out of control when uh, I had just a messed up way of thinking. I was thinking about suicide. I thought about suicide a few times. One day I was sitting there drinking and I realized I couldn't fix my problems myself. I realized that I had a problem. Every day I was spending money on drugs and alcohol and crime. About to get evicted from my apartment. Didn't have a dime or nothing. And I realized that uh, I can't keep living like this. I can't keep living from paycheck to paycheck. I can't keep going to work just living like this, spending my money on drugs and alcohol. I was a functional addict, and I had to change. I had to change or I was going to be destroyed. I was going to be just like that man lying in the gutter, waking up every day just to get a bottle to, to, uh, to drink his, his life away. Well, I finally made it to the doorsteps of Teen Challenge in 1986. Reverend Schwarzlander was waiting right there for me, and he told me right up front, this day you have to give up your cigarettes, you have to give up your marijuana, you have to give up your alcohol. He was uh, a very angry person when he came here. He had an agenda that we found out later of just coming in the program for a couple weeks to satisfy uh, parole. He only did what he felt like he wanted to do until he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I think I came to myself when I heard the Lord just through people telling me, sharing the gospel, that Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you. Jesus will give you happiness and joy. Jesus will make a way out of no way. Jesus will fix your situation. I know a person who can change your whole life. And people would tell me that. And just finally one day it sunk in. He helped me. I tried to stop. I tried to get help. I tried to go through counseling, secular counseling, humanism, been in programs that didn't work. People would talk to me and it didn't work, but God broke that curse. The anger that was there before, where before would end up in um, fists and uh, clubs and chains and blood, now is dealt with in love. He said, Brother Tiny, you come on back in here. He said, if you come in here, God is going to heal you. He's going to deliver you. You're going to get set free. I came in that day and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. My life haven't been the same since. 
God told me through a brother, if you stay in the Lord, God said he's going to take you places you've never been before, and you're going to see things you've never seen before. And God did it for me. God brought me from the jailhouse, from the crack house, now to the church house. Only God can do that. Only God can heal a soul that was as sick as mine. God want to make you over again. He wants to make you a new person. He wants to make you into a new person. And he wants to make you beautiful. He wants to take out all that evil and hurt and pains and all the sorrow, all the downtrodden, all the talk about, all the abuse you've been through. You might have been abused mentally, physically, or sexually. But God can fix it. He did it for me. And he'll do it for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you tried to run your life and it didn't work? Have you hit a wall? Have you hit the bottom? Have you done all you know to do and it's not working? Why don't you consider surrendering your will and your life to the care of God? You said, but you don't understand. My life is so out of control. Things are so messed up. I don't know if God can fix it. Think about that just a moment. The one that created the heavens and the earth the one that created all the galaxies and created every living thing and created us. If he can run the universe, don't you think he could run our life? Consider this. We're on this little ball of dirt called earth. Nothing's holding us up. We're flying out here through the universe. We circle the sun. It takes us 300, think about this, it takes 365 days to get around the sun. That's how small we are and that's how big the sun is. While we're flying around the sun, we make a complete circle every 24 hours. Scientist tells us that the earth is 22,000 something miles in circumference, which means we're spinning around and around at approximately 1,000 miles an hour, flying through the universe, circling the sun, and should we move a few degrees in any direction, we burn up or freeze to death, and there's six billion people on this little ball. If he can keep the universe in order, don't you think he can fix our life? The choice is ours, though. If we make the decision to surrender our will and our life to the care of God, then he becomes the employer and we become the employee. The only thing we have to do is stay close to him and do his work well, and he's promised us that everything we need in this life and the life to come is taken care of. But you know what? It comes to making a decision. You're the only one who can do that. Nobody can make me serve God. I don't have to serve God. I can do anything I want to do. God designed it that way. And I did what I wanted to do for a long time. But my selfishness and my self-seeking and me trying to run my life and get the things and do the things that I wanted to do brought me to a point, a point of death. I was hooked, bound, and I could not manage my life. But when I surrendered my will and my life to His care, not instantly, but all of a sudden things began to change. Now I know I was instantly forgiven, but it's a process. Old habits are hard to break, but if you'll turn it over to God and let Him run things, if He can run the universe, don't you think He can run your little life and mine? He can fix what we can't if we'll just let Him. He has the power to do it. So make the decision today to surrender to God and let Him take over. It works. It really does. Tony, what, what about the issues of pride and self-centeredness in your surrender process? Well, I'm reminded of Frank Sinatra. <laughs> when you think about Frank Sinatra, he sings the song, I Did It My Way. <laughs> and so everything I did, I wanted to do it my way. I didn't want to listen to no one's suggestions because I felt I was in charge. And so when somebody did give me a suggestion, I would like take it and say, well, we don't want to use that. We're, not go we're going to do it my way. But I would do it the same way they suggested it because it was a great ideal, but I didn't want them to make the suggestion. And they might have made a good suggestion, but I used it. And um, I'm just reminded of the scripture, uh, Psalms 34 and 6. This old man cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard his cry and delivered him out of all his troubles. 
Well, when I cried out to God, he delivered me from me. And he delivered me and gave me a heart of surrender to him to not let my will be done, but his will be done because I was going on my own strength for a long time. When, when you're proud, and this, is, this goes into the whole control thing, you, you have so much to lose by letting go of anything mm -hmm. that you have to maintain all of these <clears throat> things that you've got going on that, that give you the sense of the control that you need. When you do surrender, the beauty of it to me is that the fear is gone. You've, you've given you've given away the hold that it has on your life. And so suddenly you're free then to be who you're supposed to be and to embrace who you're supposed to be. That was a big thing for me too, just embracing who I am and doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Yeah, I can go out of the house without makeup. Mm -hmm. Oh well, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not the end of the world. Why do I care what they think? Because they're just as flawed as I am. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it can, I don't know. I could go for hours on that subject, but we get so entrapped in these things where we think, oh, I can't let go of this because this is what makes me feel secure. And yet that place of surrender, I've known way more security in that place than I've ever known in, in trying to control all of the other things. Because now I have nothing to lose. I'm, I'm willing. I'm, it's on my fingertips. Take and it. you have everything to gain. Yeah talking about surrender I had a big issue with authority if you put me in a position then everybody under me didn't they didn't listen and everybody above me didn't know what they were doing <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't I didn't know if I wanted to be in control or, or to follow but I had an issue with authority and surrender for me had to um, came from learning who God was in my life um, my father wasn't in the home I didn't have that role model it's the most important oh, it's, it's such an important factor in any child's life and he wasn't there um, and I love my father and he's, he's passed on but he wasn't there to give me that example that authority figure in my life so when you say God was my father and he was going to take care of everything I didn't have anything to compare that to I had no no idea but my pastor told me he said there's safety in obedience and that opened up when you were talking Constance that's what I thought about there, there's safety and obedience that he's responsible for me. If I'm, if I'm living according to his will, then he is prepared to take responsibility for me. If I'm in line with his will, that's where surrender came um, to, for me. Well, in that term, everything, I mean, Annie brought up something so important to me. The behavior I found much easier to surrender than the character issues, mm -hmm. the, the crack or the oh, yeah. booze or the sex or whatever. That, that's tough, but I think it's simpler to deal with that than with the issues of the heart. I, 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 that's for life. It's like what I was saying, you know, when you get knocked down flat on your back, you gotta look up. Mm -hmm. and, and I had used God in the past to help me along through the weak spots. Mm -hmm. But just as soon as I could look back on my feet, I'd say, hey, thank you, uh, you know, and, and then go on about it. <clears throat> but I'm gonna tell you what really helped me was too, was beginning to understand that God would take care of me. You know, when I went into ministry, I, I, I said, I'm not going to be a goody-goody two-shoes preacher. I'm just going to tell it like it really is in the real yes. world. Yeah. And, and so when I, I said, and I figured God's going to take care of me. And he has. And, and, and I'm not even surprised anymore. First year, I was surprised. I didn't have a car. People called me on the phone. Guy says, I'm buying a new car. Would you like my old one? I don't have any money. No, I'm going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. You know. And then, and, and, and my wife has learned not to worry. I don't worry. Uh, you know, because God literally, I believe and have great faith, he will take care of me. A friend of mine, uh, his friend Joe, was in the exact same condition. He was my drug dealer for, for a good portion of the time. He used to supply me with heroin. If I remember right, we were hanging out with a lot of people in, in this small park in Lower Manhattan. And in he comes right in the middle of the group and uh, something's different about him. He looked different. And he starts talking to people uh, about no longer using methadone, that he's off of methadone, that he's clean. And so people started to say, well, how did you get clean? And he said, Jesus Christ. And I found myself go from a place in, inside of me mocking him to wanting to listen to him and to being drawn then to what he was saying about Jesus Christ. And then I began to defend him. 
when my friends would mock him and tell him, get out of here and abuse him and curse him, I would say, no, no, let's listen to what he's saying. Obviously, he's okay. Look at him. We went up in this park house, and in the park house, like a, sort of like a little kid, I began to pray and close my eyes and ask Jesus if he would forgive me from my sins and come into my life and save me from this mess that I was in, the condition that I was in, this depression, everything. I'm crying out to him, asking him if he would forgive me and save me and be my Lord. The, the, the next months that began to follow, I still had a struggle with heroin. I, it just would not, it would not break. And one particular night, we went up to a roof, a bunch of us, we began to shoot heroin. We began to pass around a needle bunch of us shot. A couple of months later, I contracted hepatitis. And I went in my bedroom and I literally fell onto this box that I had and I just started to cry. I said, Lord, I don't want to be like this. I can't stop. I just can't. I want to follow you, but I can't stop. And I'm crying out to the Lord and I begin to sense the presence of the Lord very, very strongly as if he was outside of me and yet in me at the same time. And I, again, I didn't understand anything that happened beyond that experience. But the following month, I went to visit my friend George, who was my shooting partner when we did heroin together. And he wanted to get me back into drugs. So he pulled out his needle and his works and pulled up the heroin, put a tourniquet around his arm, and he shot right in front of me. And I had no pull at all, no pull whatsoever. And I left that. George was not open to the Lord. I kind of left him and I began to realize that God had done something in my life. The night that Jesus baptized me in the Holy Spirit, he absolutely, absolutely took out of me the desire to get high. From that time, that was December of 1972, I never used drugs again. But you see, he died for our sin. He died to, to remove the condemnation, actually, so that when we come to him in these places of bondage, he wants to touch us. He really wants to touch us. But there does have to be that opening up, that crying out, and that place of, Lord, I give you this, this absolute inability to control this thing. I give it to you. Save me here. He wants to do those kind of things. Well, we've been listening to some people that made a decision to surrender their will and their life to the care of God. You know, all my life, every time I would come to God, and I, and I know you've probably done the same thing because I knew I was guilty. I knew I'd sinned. I knew I'd done wrong. I would say, God, if you'll forgive me, I won't ever do it again. Well, I did it again. So I felt like I lied to God, and so I must not be forgiven. But you know what? By taking the approach that we're talking about, and that is I made a decision to surrender my will and my life to the care of God rather than promising God I'll never sin again. I don't want to sin, but I know if I live, I'm going to. And I know that He loves me. But my will in my life is my thoughts and my emotions. My, my emotions, my actions, my thoughts and my actions. When I surrender my thoughts and my actions to Him, something wonderful happens. You see, God loved us so much that He sent His Son into this world to die for us. Jesus did for us in the flesh God did for us in the flesh through His Son Jesus what we cannot do, and that is live a perfect life. He was a perfect lamb that takes away the sins of the world. I need that. If I will surrender to His will, and He has a will, He has a plan for our life, He has a plan for your life. You may not know what it is, but if you'll surrender your will, He'll show you, and it'll be the most wonderful life you could ever dream of. You say, well, how do I do that? I'll tell you what the Bible says, not what religion says, but what the Bible says, what God says. The Bible says in the book of Romans, the 10th chapter and the 9th verse, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Verse 13 of that same chapter says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word saved doesn't just mean we won't go to hell. It means that. But it means that when we call on his name, at that moment, we will be brought out brought out of death into life, out of bondage into freedom. So let's do it. Pray this prayer with me. If you'll say these words, say them loud enough you can hear them, say it from your heart, pray it to Him. God will do what He promised. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, 
I believe you're the Son of God. I know I'm a sinner. And I now surrender to you. From this moment on, your will be done, not mine. I give you my body, my will, and my life. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of life. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to hear from you. There'll be a number coming up in just a moment on the screen. There'll be an address you can write to. I want to hear from you. You've surrendered. God's in control. I promise you, you're headed to the land of promise. It's all yours by letting God guide your life. You were born to be free. Have you been inspired to start your journey to recovery? Please call our toll-free number, 888-665-4483, and our prayer partners can help you find a group in your area. Or you can visit our website at www.ctvn.org and click on the Born to be Free link. There you can search our online database of recovery groups near you. When you call or visit our website, request your free copy of the self-help booklet, Your Dynamic Journey to Freedom. In it, you'll find an outline of the recovery process featured in this series. So take that first step on your journey to freedom by contacting us, finding a local recovery group, and getting your free copy of this inspiring booklet. Call now, because you were born to be free. every achievement I got, I, I felt empty. I didn't feel as though I deserved it. And I discredited it and discounted myself. That pattern repeated itself uh, for many years, for many years, for many years, for many years. If it got too bad out on the streets, then I would go into a detox and I would come off the drugs and everything was great. And then I'd go out and do the same thing over again, expecting different results. And we tell ourselves we're in denial. We tell ourselves that this isn't as bad as it is. And the reason why I do this is because of this person and that person we blame. But I think when, when we begin to come to the point of seeing that I can't handle this and this is my problem, this really is mine. And, and I do not possess the ability to control this thing and overcome it fully. A lot of times people feel that, that they can't approach God in that condition because they're condemned. But you see, he died for our sin. I tried to stop. I tried to get help. I tried to go through counseling, secular counseling, humanism, been in programs that didn't work. People would talk to me and it didn't work. But God broke that curse. And by God breaking that curse now, I have the opportunity to go forward in life. And I have the opportunity to be a light to this dying world.